my name is Hai Yan Wang uh, from electrical engineering as well as material engineering. I think we don't need that slide. I do want to put in the slides actually, uh, you know, Isabella just tell me, actually she has a lot of thin film background, so I want to give a brief background introduction. So we do a lot of pulse laser deposition, uh, sputtering, and we do a lot of uh, new nanocomposite design well. We design two-phase composite structure for next generation photonic devices. And we do a lot of in situ microscopy as well. And I want to say I dig out a few news announcements. Actually, Global Foundry had many, many interesting news announcements recently. I think there was a CHIPS Act, new money put into the New York facility. Uh, I heard six billion or something. I, first I saw maybe I read the number wrong. <laughs> and it's a lot of, huh? 1.5, okay, <laughs> something, a lot of money going to Flexia. And another interesting fact is that depends on how you search, you know, uh, <coughs> top semiconductor fabrication companies, Global Foundry comes in into different ranking. But if you pop in uh, a top semiconductor manufacturer company ranked by revenue, and it comes into third place, and uh, right after TSMC and Samsung, um, it's a very surprising part. If you say top semiconductor uh, fabrication company by uh, maybe investment, you know, like a, a, a capital uh, investment. Actually, Global Foundry is very down, I think 18 or something, 20-ish. Uh, I just want to say they must have done something very interesting to make a very minimal investment in a way, uh, but for sure in the past few years grows drastically. But I just want to say the revenue ranking was drastically improved in the past probably, I don't know, five, six years. It was magic. So I just want to say here, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Isabel uh, and uh, Farin, did I? pronounce your last name, Farin, and uh, so she came from uh, actually the uh, vice president for uh, product, development. product de development. I don't have her bio with me, but anyway, so she put in some of the discussion. Actually, she received a PhD from ECE, uh, electrical engineering, so she will tell us how she got excited uh, by just a visit to, to one of the uh, foundries. Uh, foundries and she got so excited and she spent <coughs> 25 years in the semiconductor industry and now she become a vice president at the global foundry and bring that magic to real while use very low, <laughs> you know, not a lot of investment but bring a, a significant amount of revenue into the market, you know, now we are ranking number three and there was a couple of new facts I forgot to mention um, by this news link, actually you can click on the slides and you can read the news. This was by, uh, I think, uh, uh, CNBC and talked about several very interesting facts. Global Foundry is currently the only US-based uh, foundry, um, actually doing a lot of, not very, very top niche, but a lot of like a variety of different chips needs for Automobile, I think uh, in one of the pre-homework questions I, I highlighted, they do a lot of very important components, you know, for IC fabrication, which is all the industry needs. Is that right? So hopefully Isabella will tell us more about that. I will stop here. I think, oops, the, the link comes up. I'm sorry, somehow automatically. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you yeah, so no, much. <laughs> oh, I don't need the ice cream you cone. I think you can hear me okay. Can you hear okay, me okay? Great. Yes? Awesome. Yes. I see some are paying attention over there. So good, because I'll be asking you questions at the end. Now I have your attention. Look at that. All right. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Isabel Farin. I work for um, Global Foundry, so we're going to spend the next half an hour together and hopefully um, I'll get to convey a little bit or all of my excitement for you know working in the semiconductor uh, industry and then after this session you can come and ask me any question it can be questions related to semiconductor engineering or anything about the industry and the business um, in general 
So our first slide um, for introduction, um, I couldn't resist it. I met my role model um, a year ago. Do you know who that is? Next, yeah? Dr. Lisa Su, um, CEO and president of uh, AMD, started her career uh, as a um, R&D leader and product development leader, a wonderful role model for <coughs> many of us uh, at Global Foundries. I have uh, 25 years of experience in the semiconductor industry. Um, you know, throughout my career, I've had the pleasure to um, work with um, different uh, representatives of that field in the States, in Germany, Ireland, Belgium, and France. That funny accent is actually a Belgian uh, French accent. Uh, I have a dual master's degree in electrical engineering as well as a PhD. And no regrets. I think this is uh, the best uh, major um, to, to graduate uh, in. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little proud of it. Um, currently, I lead a wonderful team of about, it's actually the number is outdated, uh, 120 engineers uh, and technicians. Two thirds of the workforce um, in my product development group are based in Malta, in upstate New York, and the other third in Dresden, uh, Germany. So my team all together, we drive um, and we uh, qualify 30 um, development programs. We're between, you know, somewhere, you know, deep research and manufacturing. So what we do is we take concepts, um, we take paper models and new devices, and we turn them into silicon, and then they're ready, ready for high volume um, manufacturing. And probably the most important item on this slide is I'm a worldwide um, executive sponsor for our uh, professional network, um, professional network of women uh, within Global Foundries. So I do get the opportunity to work with all the women and all of our allies in Global Foundries to craft dedicated uh, learning opportunities to enable the growth of this underrepresented minority. And not only women, you'll see a lot more about our employee resource group um, later on. So looking back, I love that um, Professor started this uh, fun fact. How did I um, join the semiconductor industry 25 years ago? It was purely by accident. It was by chance. I was looking for an internship, was probably your age, and um, completely by chance, I visited a foundry uh, in Belgium, a 100 millimeter and 200 millimeter fabrication facility. And I knew nothing about uh, semiconductor physics. Uh, my major was actually in analog design as well as in optoelectronics communications. I didn't know anything about Moore's law, but at the end of the uh, clean room tour, I met somebody, um, the head of the reliability lab who was holding a wafer and she just transmitted our passion for the job and opportunities. And I realized at that point, without knowing anything about Moore's law, that there were opportunities to learn. And as an engineer, I hate being bored and I need to have something to work on. And so I look back and I think, wow, 25 years ago, I didn't know that I would still be as excited to work in semiconductor industry today than I was back then. Now, that's my personal story. Behind that, there's a lot more, right? This innovation and this growth was fueled for the four decade, past decades by what we call Moore's Law. And I, I'm told that Professor Lundstrom told you everything about Moore's Law, so I'm not going to explain why for four decades it was all about shrinking critical dimensions, having transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. When I started, the critical dimensions or gate length of transistor was at one micron. Working on a 130 nanometer gate length was considered advanced research. Today, we're working on two nanometer uh, critical dimensions. So the four, past four decades, it was all about the CMOS roadmap, scaling that was driven by lithography. It was all about compute power, so CPUs, GPUs were all the rage. This was what was driving innovation, flash memory technologies, this was really the center of attention for semiconductors. We spoke about foundry and manufacturing. Fa past four decades was all about deploying capital to build more capacity to produce more and more of these chips. You can see here, you know, this, this illustrates basically it's, it's the, the revenue generated. It's basically a proxy for demand for chips and semiconductors since 1996. And what you see here is that there's an insatiable demand for semiconductor devices. Yes, 
it is cyclical. Year over year, you do see that every three to four years, there's, there's a cycle. You know, it's, the industry is corrected through inventory and product life cycle. But overall, what you see is that the demand for semiconductor chips is, keeps on growing year over year. So the message here is that as much as 25 years ago, me joining the semiconductor industry was really driven by you know, a personal connection. Somebody reached out to me and said, look, this is wonderful what we do here in this reliability lab. Would you like to come and characterize FND MOS, Zener diodes? And I said, well, why not? Looks exciting. You look happy. So yes, I'll join your lab. Behind that, there was something that was driving that innovation and that growth, and it drove innovation and growth um, in material science, des compute design and architectures, and in equipment capabilities. Fast forward, the industry reaches two nanometer. Is it, is it the end of the world? Um, not necessarily. Yes, you can have some specific effects. It's called tunnel effects, but um, it might cause some, uh, some concerns. But we leave that to other industries. Professor, you mentioned early on uh, global foundries, the revenue grew tremendously, actually in the past five to seven years after our CEO, Dr. Caulfield, joined um, the, the, or uh, acceded to the um, presidency of the company, simply because we made a pivot and we decided, well, look, there are companies who know how to manufacture 10 nanometer, five nanometer, two nanometer transistors. We don't need to have too many of these companies around. Every time a customer tapes out to these companies, it takes half a billion or more investment and resources. Are they going to make an investment of that nature twice? Very likely not. So we thought, well, look, CPUs and GPUs, this is great. Compute power, it's what? 35 to 40% of the total semiconductor market? There's still plenty for us to go after and really play a role in this industry and in, in the world. <clears throat> And when we say we pivoted, we said, well, the golden age of semiconductors is certainly not behind us. There's a lot more, a lot more we can contribute to. And I show here a couple of markets where really the semiconductor industry is going to continue to grow, right? And I intentionally don't put any CPU or GPU on this slide. I don't focus on AI, even though you know, this is very important and is going to drive a lot more innovation. We're focusing on what we call the at the edge of AI, right? The compute power is important, but sensor, acquiring that data, being able to transfer that data at very high speed, managing the power consumption is equally as important as the compute power. And so when you look at these pictures, I, I don't think any of us can say, oh, automotive? No, it's, it's not driving a higher consumption in electronics. Think about the infotainment that you have in your car today compared to what it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. Think about microcontrollers, the safety features that you have in your car, and it's going to continue to grow. Think about when you charge your electrical vehicle. You don't want to spend an hour waiting for your car to be you know, ready to go. You want to be able to do that in a couple of minutes. It's going to drive innovation. And all of this? fueled by semiconductors. Think in, of home and industrial IoT, Internet of Things, right? Anybody has one of these at home? Or maybe let me ask you, who doesn't? Okay, I respect that, but okay, three or four? All right, we're going to have a lot of more of these. Now it comes with you know, the pitfall of having to manage the power consumption behind that. So what it's driving is actually a need for more devices with lower power consumption, because when you add them up all together, well, you want to make sure your electricity bill, but overall, you know, the energy that's pumped through these devices is not uh, going through the roof. Smart mobile devices. Now let me ask again, who does not have a smart mobile device? Obviously, you are here with your laptops and your phones. Um, <clears throat> again, it's more about bandwidth data transmission, integrity of the data, secure data transmission, you're going to see a need for even more semiconductor. Um, who has never had a phone that overheated, right? That's a problem too. So again, power consumption with higher data transmission rate, uh, more data storage 
is going to become more and more important and is going to fuel the growth. Communications, infrastructure and data center, um, again, transmitting a lot of data through copper wires, it's not going to be very um, power friendly. So what are the alternatives? And then aerospace defense and, and critical infrastructure, again, it's a, a very important and critical topic for national um, security and competitiveness. So what we decided to do at Global Foundries is, is, look, there are companies who know very well how to manufacture two nanometer, but all of this, all of this actually doesn't require two nanometer devices. It can still work on 180 nanometer, 130. The technology nodes where it's not the critical dimensions that matter. What matters, take the automotive uh, field for instance, what matters to you when you get into your car? Safety, reliability. You want to get into your car and know that you can reach destination and you don't have to worry about your safety, would your brakes work or not, right? It's all about reliability. And for that, this is not a two nanometer technology that's going to provide it, okay? So in other words, and without expanding too much on the topic, for each of these markets, they have very specific application targets. Okay. And this is what's going to drive the innovation for these markets, and there's plenty. So I just wanted to quote our president and CEO. <clears throat> for us, what's important and what's driving innovation it's not Moore's law. It's not advanced lithography capability. It's about the capability to add specific features, embedded non-volatile memories, high voltage uh, devices, um, RF, uh, sub terahertz devices, adding features, making them energy efficient. I think I've said it a couple of times already. Low power consumption, secure, feature rich, and all of that because this is really essential for the industry I'm in, at the best economics. At the end of the day, you are our customers and you don't want to pay that innovation at a price that's tenfold what you're paying today. So we always have in mind the better cost um, at the best economics and also with a sturdy supply chain. So what does that mean in practice? Okay? <clears throat> and pay attention, I'll ask you questions about all these acronyms. No, I'm kidding. Um, what does that mean? So far, a lot of the devices that were at the center of Moore's law were based on bulk silicon. High purity, you know, sand, in other words. Now, when we talk about innovation and we talk about supporting the markets I just uh, covered uh, just now, there's a series of different substrates devices, materials, architectures that come into play. Uh, what I'm doing here is, of course, I'm not going to ask you questions about what is a FinFET, what is a trigate device, what is a gate all around device, what is a fully depleted um, SOI or substrate on insulator. That's not my point. What I want to show you is, it's not only about shrinking dimensions, it's also leveraging the rich ecosystem, you know, for substrates, for instance, silicon on insulator, wide band gap uh, materials, gallium nitride, silicon carbide. Um, it's about using, you know, silicon germanium technologies that we leverage to actually produce high frequency devices. And it's also leveraging silicon photonics. And look at how can we increase the bandwidth the data rate, the transmission um, uh, rate, uh, without you know, increasing tenfold the power consumption and, 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 and heating associated with it. So you see, innovation can take many uh, different shapes. It can be different types of device architectures, different types of substrates, um, wide band gap materials. It can also focus on power management devices, so only uh, CMOS, it's also bipolar transistors, LDMOS, there's a whole suite of devices where it's basically, it's my pay playground, it's my team's playground. So I couldn't resist it, and I wanted to share with you two slides. This is the first one where I want to show um, an example of what we do in our foundry. Um, I don't want to bore you to death with numbers about the mobility, the electron mobility and the band gap of gallium nitride. This is a picture of one of our 
um, gallium nitride devices based on a 180 nanometer um, platform technology. But I wanted to uh, illustrate two important points. The first one is we are builders, we are makers. When I think of my team of technologists, I think of architects. Right? They take building blocks, they understand material properties, they understand that if we use that type of wet clean, it will remove that amount of silicon, it will be selective to silicon nitride or germanium. They know how to build things. They will take a, a concept, a device on paper, and they will turn it into this. So being a semiconductor technologist is fun because you get to build things. If you like to play with Legos, I do, I still do with my kids. Um, this is something you can do for real. And this is really how we drive innovation. Very important, seeing is believing. I had the privilege to visit earlier today the Berg Nanotechnology Center. I must say I was thoroughly impressed by the capabilities you have over there. I can tell you, I couldn't find a characterization technique that, um, that is not available over there. And all of them were using them, you know, in our world to actually build these very advanced devices. So if anything, I, I think you should be very proud that you're here um, with Purdue. I don't get any um, uh, credit for that. Um, the other point I want to make, uh, besides seeing is believing and being able to be hands-on and build uh, devices is the importance of being able to characterize them electrically and understand what that means. You know, on my team, I have technologists, the architects, remember, those who play with Lego blocks, and then I have device engineers. And what they do is they, they characterize either at high frequency or high voltage the properties of these devices. And it's a feedback loop telling us how does the breakdown voltage will evolve as a function of the dimensions of these devices. I don't know what you think of it, but I think this is super cool. Anyhow, another example I want to share with you is that very different designs um, can take place and can drive innovation. It doesn't have to be your standard transistor. Your four, you know, um, four um, uh, um, uh, prong approach device with a gate, um, source and drain and bulk, a device can have a very different shape uh, compared to your regular CMOS transistors. This is, for instance, for silicon photonics, it's a micro ring resonator that allows us to separate different type of um, uh, wavelengths. The features that we process here are in the order of the micrometer. It's still very important to attach fibers. These are V-groups. So overall, my net message for this one here is that technology, again, is not only solely driven by advanced lithographic capability or um, innovation at the nanometer scale. It can also take place through innovative designs as well as essential features. This one, for instance, would help us um, transmit signal at a very high rate and without the power and um, heat consumption uh, as their co copper counterpart. Now, when we talk about innovation, um, in our case, I want to um, give a glimpse of what it looks like within Global Foundries. Uh, we have teams around the globe, <coughs> and I don't know if you can um, oops, see it well, but we have teams located around the globe. Uh, mine are located here in upstate New York, as well as in Germany. And when we innovate, we really innovate as one team around the globe. So we do leverage capabilities that are available in every of our fabs. Overall, we cover and have a presence in 10 countries and time zones and have 11 uh, service languages. Professor mentioned it earlier too. Um, the government, uh, the, 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 the state of New York, as well as the federal uh, government do recognize that semiconductor, semiconductor industry is vital. It's essential. It's essential to uh, continuing doing what we do today, but also to grow and for our uh, national security. So you will see that um, <clears throat> the administration has taken very bold steps and is uh, funding the growth of our manufacturing um, site and will continue um, in the state of New York, as well as in our facility in Vermont, where we've manufactured uh, on 200 millimeter wafers, uh, gallium nitride um, technologies and products. So I don't know, if that doesn't get you excited to see that there's an investment of that nature, I don't know what will. 
Now I want to touch a little bit about the most important asset that we have in our cooperation, um, and it's our people. Very important. Today, finding qualified personnel and workforce to work on that equipment and to deliver that innovation um, is really critical to our success. And we need more and more engineers and um, innovators like you to join the semiconductor workforce. It's a very diverse workforce, and I insist on that point, it's very important. Multicultural workforce. Um, if you ever have the chance to enter the clean room, and I would invite you when you come to Malta um, to come to visit Global Foundries, when you enter the clean room, you will see that it's a highly complex, highly complex um, uh, set of equipment. And that complexity in itself is what drives the need for a diverse workforce. What we're looking for is the brightest um, uh, engineers to come and join us. And it means we are not limiting you know, this, the hiring effort to the United States, but we go look for the brightest. Very important, and it's not a fun fact, this is close and dear to my heart, 25% of our workforce is female. And we'll talk about that uh, later on. Very important to, um, to mention as well, because of our diversity, if you bring together a very diverse workforce, multicultural, coming from different backgrounds, it's not working until you realize that you have to make a conscious and deliberate effort to embrace that workforce. There will be frictions because we don't speak the same language or we don't come from the same background and that's okay, but we have to be able to address that so we can work as one. I'm very proud as the executive sponsor of our network for the development of um, women, very proud to say that we have 10 unique employee resource groups uh, that have a presence in most of our sites and 21 ERG chapters across all of our um, locations. What that means is that if you identify with any of these groups from our veterans, to um, parents or Latinos, or if you work 100% remote, you will find employee resource groups who will be there to help you be successful, even if you are you know, one of the few within your community. And this is important, and I believe that this is a game changer, being able to be very, very um, um, appreciative of the diversity we bring to our teams. Another word I wanted to share with you is when you leave uh, school, when you complete your undergrad or grad studies, innovation and research doesn't end there because you're entering a manufacturing you know, company like Global Foundries. We do have multiple partnerships and actually this is not up to date. We have many more in terms of strategic university partnerships that I could have added here. But we continue, and especially my team, to be very active and in partnerships with R&D centers and universities. So for those of you who want to keep thinking you know, about, okay, what's the next device? How can I partner with a university like Purdue? We do have these partnerships in place. And I think that's important, that as you leave the school, you remember you know, to be a lifelong um, learner. Also very important, I, present, I, I shared with you what was the past, more slow. What is the present, where we have an opportunity, there's still a high demand for semiconductor devices. But I want to reiterate, you are our future. And we understand that this workforce is looking for flexibility. Um, <clears throat> is also keeping an eye on their finances, and so it's important. And you're also looking at your own future uh, and building families. So, I'm proud to say, of all of you, our new hires, a third of our, our new hires are new college graduates. We do have a student loan repayment program. And in addition to this, every year we actually um, cover tuition fees uh, for those of you who want to take uh, extra classes outside of Global Foundries. We do have our opportunity to actually work from home. We understand that for many this is important. and. Last but not least, 100% paid parental leave, um, 20 weeks paid maternity, and adoption leave. 
might not be relevant to you today, but believe me, at some point, to be able to do what I did and build my career, having that opportunity to balance both your, your, your family and professional duties is very important. I want to leave you with two more slides. Um, hopefully, this conveyed well why there is a future and the golden age of semiconductors is not behind us. If anything, it's ahead of us and you're going to be part of it. Um, I want to reiterate and share with you a little bit my personal, my professional journey. And I intentionally didn't choose a straight road or a straight line. When I first entered the workforce, you know, in semiconductor foundry, it was a little bit daunting and overwhelming. It's actually, you know, you, you, you are a material scientist or an electrical engineer or you work in procurement, in business or in finance, you can find uh, a place within the semiconductor industry. It doesn't have to be a straight line and you don't have to think of your career as 40 years within the same role. If you're mobile and you're willing to move um, and understand and, and get a little bit better understanding of um, how different cultures work, this is important as well, and this has been very important in my career as well. Did I just turn on the subtitles? I'm so sorry. Being tech savvy is important as well. Um, but most importantly, it's not a straight line, and it's, it's about um, being able to take bold, uh, to make bold moves, take risks, and, and sometimes, you know, change roles. I've been an R&D engineer. I started as a process engineer in a fab. Um, thank you so much. After my master's degree, I didn't think a PhD was for me. There was nobody else in my family with a PhD, so I didn't know any better and I didn't have a mentor. Three years later, I realized, well, I do see the value of pursuing PhD studies. Not only can I have a deeper understanding of some very technical aspects, but I also can learn how to generate intellectual property, how to protect it, how to publish, how to write an article and a paper, um, there was a lot of benefits to, you know, going through that PhD journey. Um, I started as a device engineer, and then one day, um, you know, I had the opportunity to become the chief of staff of our CEO. And he asked me, is this something you would like to do? And I give you 24 hours to decide. And I said, yes. Sometimes you don't know. Um, it's a matter of, again, it's a leap of faith. You remember that story I said, er, uh, shared earlier on? It's about a connection with a person. It's about being willing and open to, to take risks and, and see for yourself, right? We have only one life, so go for it. And then I decided, I shared that earlier on, um, to um, join a module engineering group and head the ThinFIMS department. And now I'm, after two years expect in Germany, I'm back in the US to lead a team. So again, it's more about encouraging you to take bold steps uh, in your careers. I don't think there's any risk for as long as you open to, you know, taking the lessons and learning and trying and engaging um, with, uh, with your colleagues and leaders. So I will leave you with um, this. A thing or two uh, I learned along the way. Um, solving engineering challenges is fun. Don't ever lose sight of this. You are going to find it challenging, difficult. There will be uh, setbacks, two steps forward, one step back. But it's about solving problems, solving them together. And there will be setbacks. There's no failure, learning, but it's fun. Don't lose sight of that. All right, can I see a smile? All right, good. And then a couple of things I learned that we don't learn when we are uh, in undergrad, uh, you know, uh, college is um, don't be shy. Take your seat at the table. I mean, you are engineers. You must have an opinion. You must have ideas. So it's not by sitting at the back of the room and blending with the wallpaper that you are going to grow your career and make a difference or be innovators. So take your seat at the table. Don't, don't wait for an invitation to come to you. Manage your effort and your attitude. Everybody in this room is super smart, right? That, that's a given. You're here in Purdue, you're super smart. That's not a differentiator. That's not. What's going to make the difference is how you connect, how you, you know, uh, address problems. Um, it's, it's your attitude. 
that's going to be the differentiating factor. And if there's there only one thing you should take away from this presentation, it's really, it's really that. Celebrate small victories because, again, innovation and research is about baby steps and, and improving uh, things incrementally. You see that in our industry, there can be some pressure. Um, our product have very defined, well-defined uh, life cycles. Our customers have requirements and we have to deliver. It's a fast paced 24-7 uh, environment. There can be some pressure, but we learn to manage that. The most important, remember, is attitude. Always give the benefit of the doubt. Everybody's super smart. Again, nobody wants to do any harm or steal your results or your data. Always give the benefit of the doubt. And last but not least, um, nurture your professional network. That's also one very um, um, important item that's going to make a difference for you. I really love to see here that you take a very collaborative approach. Please bring that with you, you know, after you graduate. This is going to make a difference. N grow your professional network within the company, onside the company. Um, and it's a small world, you'll see. We, we'll meet again, you know, in the semiconductor uh, world. Thank you. Thank you. Very exciting, very nice talk. And I hope so. Let's I hear it. To, uh, I think it's some of the key points. I took notes. Okay, so uh, I do have, I, I, I think it's thanks to the team actually bring se several questions together from your input. So I'm going to uh -oh. <laughs> put in a few questions. <clears throat> I think several of them I felt is very interesting. As a foundry, how do you address some of the very big varieties in fabrication needs by other companies, so your customers? How do you address that? There's a lot of varieties in design, in varieties in needs. You know, how do you address that? I thought that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good question. So it starts with understanding um, application requirements and specifications. Really understanding um, specifications in terms of reliability. So you've seen automotive, for instance. Um, there are different types of technology qualifications. It can be for consumers. It can be for automotive customers. It can be right at heart. It can be for space uh, and defense applications. So each of them, or RF, each of them will have specific uh, requirements. And it starts by really capturing well what are the requirements. So obviously, your, uh, your car, you want it to be able, especially if it's a microcontroller, you want it to be able to operate within a certain range of temperature. Um, you want to have a level of defectivity that is extremely low. Again, it goes back to understanding what's important for your customer. Once you understand really well the, what they are looking for, I'll give an example you know, I'm the closest with is how do we uh, bring that back to our factory and how do we start the development work? So it starts by one, engaging with R&D entities and uh, universities and understanding for new types of devices and features, what is their experience, what materials do we need. We engage with our equipment suppliers and sometimes we bring on board within our factory what we call first-of-a-kind first capability tooling and we run prototypes with our customers. So mm. it's going to be a journey with our customers starting with understanding really well the specifications, working with equipment suppliers, material suppliers, R&D centers, to understand what equipment can yeah. enable that. Mm -hmm. And then remember, it's a foundry. So we bring this new equipment together with equipment that is already you know, running manufacturing, high volume manufacturing. So mm. it's, it's a subtle art yeah. how to bring both together in the same, uh, in the same site. Mm -hmm. But it yeah, always it starts with really understanding very well what are the technology spe specifications. Could be a breakdown voltage, it could be a temperature range, it could be CPCPK requirements, defectivity requirements uh, from our customers. Yeah, maybe a follow up how long it will take from that communication, or maybe there's a need to the end, you know, well, you do large volume manufacturing. How long would it take that life cycle? How long was that? It can be very short. Okay. And it depends if it's we're tweaking the properties of a device. Mm. 
we are increasing the transconductance of a device, we are shrinking the area of uh, you know, the logic um, uh, devices. It can be very quick. Mm -hmm. It can be three months qualification time, six months. For some customers, it's not only the qualification of our technology that matters. They will also take these chips, they'll ask us to provide hundreds of samples, oh. and they will put them in the field. Oh. And then they will subject yes, them to harsher uh, conditions, and that's okay. where the cycle for qualification can take a little bit longer. So again, it really varies, you know, depending on who is the customer in the application. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have another uh, couple of questions. Um, you know, maybe um, I think the question is about what are the major advancements for efficiency and performance that Global Foundry maybe recently bring in, you would like to highlight, you know, one or two, you know. So what are the major advancements for, let's say, improving efficiency and performance? That question <laughs> maybe sounds weird. Okay, so. And I'm on record, so I have to be very <laughs> careful about what I say. Okay. Major advancement for efficiency and prop, uh, performance that Global Foundry maybe made in the past, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think of the development of some of our uh, RF devices, and I will not go into um, too much detail, but touching the 500 gigahertz FT and Fmax okay. is really one of the accomplishments of my team I'm very proud of. Um, and it is integrated on a ultra low pl power platform. So we work with uh, FinFETs as well as a fully depleted SOI um, technology. So re really breaking the barrier of 500 gigahertz in the manufacturing environment um, is an accomplishment I'm, I'm very proud of. So if my team Your sees team that, well that. done. Um, and then we have uh, quite a few accomplishments and without going into the details, we didn't talk about this type of devices, but embedding non-volatile memories, right? Um, we don't talk too much uh, about it. I know our competitors are uh, very active in that field. Actually, there are quite a few players active in that field, but look, the replacement, what comes after flash uh, memory um, is, is very important. So we have uh, quite a, a couple of uh, accomplishments in, uh, in, uh, in the field of embedding non-volatile memory manufacturing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, there's another very relevant to many of the students. And so they want to say, how do they, I mean, what are the things they can do to stand out when they apply for internship at a global foundry? <laughs> so they said they search it on the website, their opportunity as an internship, you know, at a global foundry. But how do we prepare ourselves? to be, you know, stand out, you know, something like that. What are, what are the things you will encourage you them to do or, or suggest them, give them some suggestions? Okay. So their resume will stand out, wow, that's the best prepared. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, by the way, I, I'll take the opportunity to introduce my colleague, uh, Josley, from our recruitment team over here. Um, if you have questions uh, on, on recruitment and onboarding, please do um, uh, talk to her. Um, what's very important to me is, again, I go back to your attitude. Um, what I really appreciate is when an engineer joins and shows that he or she or they are willing to be hands-on, that they've had past experience uh, working in the lab, uh, working with technicians, right? Our engineering degree doesn't mean that we are above, you know, technicians. We work with technicians. So um, being very humble, respectful. Um, again, it's all about collaborations and um, some proof points that you've worked in the lab. Hands-on work um, is important. Um, that you know about a bit about the semiconductor industry, you know, the latest and greatest about some of the devices that we manufacture, be it in RF technology or ENVM. So again, it's more about, I'm not expecting, um, I'm not expecting students to, to file a patent uh, after their internship. The expectations are first and foremost that you learn, you create connections and um, express a willingness to, you know, do hands-on uh, work. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so now the podium is open for questions, you know, and any additional questions from the audience? 
And if you don't ask, I'll, I'll pick and choose. <laughs> any, any questions? Well, we have a question yeah. over here. Okay. So I'm, I'm friends with one of the double professors who does rings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I'm friends with one of the double E professors who does research in microwave photonics. So I'm just kind of curious, um, what wavelengths do you guys <coughs> work with in your photonics in your photonics projects? Oh my God, that's a very good question. I let me go back to you on this one because I know we're working with actually multiple wavelengths. That's why you've seen the mux and demux and micro um, and the modulator. So if you actually, if you contact me after this and give me your name, I'll make sure to give you plenty of information. I loved, you said you were going to be at Meredith South, right? I will. All right, I'll stop by. Thank you. Great. Good point. Okay, other questions? Any other questions? Maybe, uh, okay, there is one. Okay, so okay, I will get back to you. I'm also doing research in um, photonics. So um, do you have any numbers on like how, how um, the photonic interconnects have reduced like power consumption or like reduced latency? I do, I do have quite a number, it's not in this presentation, okay. but again, I'm happy to follow up with the latest and greatest. Actually, okay. we have a strong representation at the uh, OFC, at OFC this week in San Diego, where we're presenting our results. Um, so I will share that with you as well. Um, it, it is, to, to build on your question, it is a good field to, you know, to, to study or to work on, uh, especially the uh, 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 packaging uh, aspects and, uh, and the ecosystem around uh, silicon photonics. Um, this is a, a hot topic these days. Not that everybody has to work on silicon photonics, but it's a, a great spot to be in. Uh, I saw during your like segment breakdown that like. I'm sorry, uh, I cannot. Right. Can you speak louder? Okay. <coughs> uh, I saw during your segment break breakdown, like I know automotive is like a very big industry for semiconductors, but I saw like compared to the U.S., you guys were a lot more involved in like the automotive industry in Europe compared to the U.S. Is there like any reason for that? Uh, no, actually, we are very, very active in, in Europe in the automotive sector. It's primarily around MCUs, microcontroller mm -hmm. units. Um, in terms of activities, um, so my team in Germany, their focus, it's, it, there's, it's a center of excellence for embedded non-volatile memories, and we qualify them for automotive applications, so grade zero uh, qualifications. Um, microcontroller units, but also um, uh, infotainment. Um, for us in the States, we also focus on ENVM qualified for auto grade. Um, but also for, um, uh, we're also primarily working on gallium nitride in our 200 millimeter facility um, in, um, in, in Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont. But I cannot say that we have one side that's more focused on automotive than, than another. Uh, if anything, what we do is, we touched on that early on, sometimes we have to bring in uh, first of a kind capability, new tooling. And, and again, it's all about how we manage, you know, um, bringing new tools, um, the cost associated with it. What we do is we leverage that at the global level. So we'll bring some capability in one side. It doesn't mean that the other sites won't leverage that, right? So we'll be working remotely, sending wafers back and forth between our different facilities. So overall, I cannot say that in the States, we're focused on just the market segment and nothing else. It's actually very, very broad.